Good morning, church. Our scripture reading will be from John 3, verse 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. For God sent his son not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And this is the word of God. Amen. I'd like to share a song, The Longer I Serve Him, The Sweeter He Is. Thank you, Eva, for that beautiful song. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. God is good. And all the time. All right. Amen. He is great all the time. Before we begin, shall we have a word of prayer? Father, we come before you once again on this day of life that you have granted us. You've watched over us this past week, and you have blessed us with watch, care, and protection, food, and shelter, and sanity, which so many people do not have, Father, today. We thank you for your mercy and grace. We thank you for drawing us here, and we ask for your presence to be among us. May your message come from you today. May this message come from you and not from me. May it touch the hearts of the people through the power of your Holy Spirit. And may each of us, Father, draw closer to you as we learn more about your beauty, your mercy, and your grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you all have a good week this week? Well, you're here, so something went right, right? Amen. Amen. We're going to do a lot of Bible flipping this morning, so you'll have to pardon me. Uh, Let's turn to Exodus 24. So in Exodus 24, Moses is about to go up 
on the mountain to meet with God. And he and Joshua go up a little ways, and he tells in verse 13, it says, Moses arose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, wait here for us until we come back to you. Jumping to verse 18, so Moses went up into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Now, there's a lot of symbolism here that we miss. Moses went up into the cloud to be with God. Who else went up into a cloud to be with God? Jesus, Acts chapter 1, verse 9, and he said after this, and after he said this, he was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid them, hid him out of their sight. There is far more symbolism and connection of Bible verses than we actually realize. This morning we're going to look at some of that, and we're going to try and get the understanding of how does this all tie in to John 3, 16 and 17. 3, 16 is probably the most well-known verse among Christians and non-Christians. But what does it really mean? What does it really mean? In Luke 19, Jesus is telling a parable about a nobleman who went into a far country. And he talked to his servants, and he delivered them some goods to take care of, and he told them to do what? Occupy till I come. Occupy till I come. What does that mean, occupy till I come? What exactly is he talking about? We go back to Exodus. Moses is up in the mountain. For how long does it say he was up in the mountain? 40 days. 40 days, 40 nights. What was going on down below in the camp? Who can tell me? Rebellion. What did the people begin to do? They said what? They said, well, this Moses, he went up there, and we don't know what happened to him, right? We don't know what happened to him. It's only been 40 days now. Think about this. 40 days, and they've already begun to do what? Lose faith. 40 days, Moses is up there. And is the mountain still covered with smoke and fire? So there's still evidence of God's presence there. He had brought them out of Egypt for great miracles. He'd parted the Red Sea. Here they are at the base of a mountain surrounding it with fire and smoke up top. It's only been 40 days. There's still evidence that God is there, and they begin to do what? They begin to do what? They begin to go back to the way they were taught in Egypt, to worship idols. So quickly, so quickly did they begin to go. You know, in Revelation 22, 12, it says, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Moses was only up there for 40 days. Jesus has been in heaven for a lot longer. Are we ready for his return? Or are we distracted? You know, the Bible says, As in the days of Noah, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, the people were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage up to the day that Noah entered into the ark. What were they doing? They were going about their regular business, right? They're going about their regular business. What about God's business? What about God's business? In Exodus 32:26. It says, then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp. Now Moses comes down, and guess what? The people weren't ready for his return, were they? They weren't ready. They were doing what? They were partying and doing all sorts of other things, some of them. But there was a small group of people who were what? Who were faithful, who did not get involved in that activity. And in verse 26, it says, Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. You know, Jesus is calling each of us today. Right now, Jesus is calling you to come and be his. And all the sons of Levi, it says, gathered themselves together to him. 
2,000, about 2,000 years ago, Jesus ascended into the clouds. And generations of our forefathers have been saying what? He's coming soon. Is he? Do you believe he's coming soon? Think before you answer, because it has very, it's a very serious thing to answer before God. Do we truly believe he's coming soon? Deuteronomy 11.29, it says, When the Lord your God has brought you into the land you are entering to possess, you are to proclaim on Mount Gerizim blessings and on Mount Ebal curses. So Moses is about to transfer authority over to who? Over to Joshua. Right? He's been told by God that he cannot go into the promised land, and so he's preparing Joshua for taking over leadership of the Israelites. And he tells Joshua that when they go over into the new land, that Joshua is to separate the tribes into two groups and place one group on one mountain for a blessing and one group on another mountain for a list of curses. And Joshua, being a diligent leader, he's going to go and do this. And in Deuteronomy 28, let's go there. Deuteronomy 28, let's take a look at what Moses told the, the people very quickly. Deuteronomy 28. In Deuteronomy 28, Moses gives nine blessings, approximately, in verses 1 to 14. And in verses 15 to 68, you'll notice how much longer that is. In verses 15 to 68, he gives approximately 43 curses. Now, how would you feel if you were the Israelites? Here's nine blessings, and here's 43 curses. How, of, how many of us would want more than one curse from God? And he's listing 43. And if you look at verse 68, and the Lord will take you back into Egypt. Now this is on the Mount of Cursings. And he says, and the Lord will take you back into Egypt in ships by the way which I said to you, you shall never see it again. And you shall be offered for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves, but no one will buy you. In other words, if they failed to follow God's way, they were going, what's Egypt a symbol of? It's a symbol of slavery. They were going to go back into slavery. Slavery to what? Let's make it modern times. Slavery to sin. If we fail to surrender our hearts to Jesus and follow him, we're going to become slaves of sin. We're going to go right back to where we were before. And he says, but no one will buy you. Imagine that. No one would buy them. What do these mountains mean? Between Malachi and John the Baptist and the scene, there were about 400 years. And in Matthew 5 1, let's turn there. Matthew 5 1. Jesus is going to give what sermon? The Beatitudes, the blessings, right? He's going to give those blessings. Now, as Moses turned leading the people over to Joshua, John the Baptist turned leading the disciples over to who? Over to Jesus, right? He turned them over to Jesus. And in chapter 5, verse 1, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated... His disciples came to him, the twelve, and he opened his mouth and taught and blessed them. How many blessings do you think there were? Nine. Nine blessings. Let's go back to Deuteronomy. Let's go to Deuteronomy 27.
Now, Moses tells them when they go to the Mount of Cursing, Mount Ebal, that they were to set up an altar of burnt offering, and they were to eat peace offerings and do what? In verse 7, look at verse 7 with me. You shall offer peace offerings, and you shall eat there and rejoice before the Lord. What mountain were they to rejoice on? The Mount of Cursing. Over 40 curses on this mountain they were spoken, and they were to rejoice. Why were they to rejoice on the Mount of Cursing? 43 curses, and they were to rejoice on that mountain. Who of us could rejoice with a list of 43 curses? What is the purpose? Why were they told to rejoice? When you think about it, those 43 curses, we read them carefully, remind us of the bitterness of the cup of the wrath of God. Who drank that cup? Jesus drank that cup. For who? For us. Use the two-letter word. For me. Point your finger at yourself. Jesus drank that cup for me. For you. So could they rejoice knowing that? Yes, because those curses pointed to what the Lamb of God would do for you and I. That sacrifice on that mount of cursing ties into the sacrifice that Jesus gave at Golgotha. He accepted those curses for you and I. In Romans, it says, verse Chapter 8, verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Christ on Calvary canceled our debt. Romans 6.23 says that the penalty of sin is what? Is death. So when you sin, and let's personify sin and death for a minute just to make this analogy easier. When you agree with sin and do what sin wants you to do, he tells death to take your life. Death now has a right to take you. When Adam sinned, sin was able to say to death, you can take him. And what happened to Adam? He died. And what happened to Eve? She died. Why? Because they had sinned. And there is only one person in all of time that has never sinned. That death never had a right to. Turn with me please to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Chapter 5 verse 21. For he, who's he? God the Father made him, who's him? Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Turn with me, please, forward a little bit to 1 Peter. Chapter 2, verse 22. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. First John says there was no sin in Jesus. Amen? So did death have any right to Jesus? No. First Peter 2.24 says he himself bore our sins in his body on a cross that, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. Do you know if we're not looking at the cross, we'll never die to sin. Ever. 
We've got to see the cross for what it is and for what it means. We need to understand exactly what Jesus did. So sin goes to death and says, I really hate this Jesus. Take his life. Now, did sin have a right to take, tell death to take his life? No, because Jesus, we just read, had done what? Never sinned. So sin sinned, and what does Romans say? The penalty of sin is death. So what is God, what is God going to do with sin? He's going to eradicate it, is he not? Isn't sin going to go away forever? Yes. And so death goes and takes Jesus. Did death have a right to take his life? No. He didn't. So death sinned, and he's on death row. And Revelation 20.14 says, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, and the lake of fire is the second death. So what happens to sin and death? They're going to be gone for how long? Forever. Praise the Lord. Is anybody alive out there? So death takes Jesus' life, and how long was he able to hold him for? Three days. Because he had no right. He had no right to Jesus. John 10, 18 says, No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up. This command I have received from my Father. So when Jesus decides it's time to get up, can death hold him? No. Praise God he was able to get up. Because if he wasn't a risen Savior, our religion would be like all the other religions who had prophets, right? They're all dead. They're all buried. But we have a what? A risen Savior with a promise. With a promise. Go with me, please, to 1 Kings 17. So we're at Mount Carmel. We're at Mark, Mount Carmel. And Elijah's there. And there had been a famine for how long? Three and a half years. How long was Jesus here? Three and a half years. You know, the more we study the Bible, the more we're going to see how the Old Testament ties into the New. There are so many parallels. It's incredible. It's incredible. So Elijah talks to the king, and all of Israel comes to the mountain. And what happens? He says what? Let's have a challenge. Let's have a challenge. Bring all the prophets of Baal, and let's gather on Mount Carmel, and I challenge you to build an altar to your God and to put your sacrifice on there, but don't light a fire, and let's see if your God can take care of that sacrifice. And so they build the altar, and it gets to be about noon, and what happens? No fire. Hmm, wonder what happened. No fire. Why was there no fire? Because they were worshiping a false god. You worship a false god, there's no power. So there's no fire, and Elijah gets a little overzealous, and he gets a little rambunctious, and he begins to mock them. What's going on? Is your god asleep? Has he gone on a journey? Maybe he's not listening. And so they yell, and they scream, and they cut themselves, and they do all sorts of stuff, and... Nothing happened. So then about the time of the evening sacrifice, when did Jesus die? About the time of the evening sacrifice. After three and a half years, Elijah takes 12 stones. What does the number 12 represent? The 12 tribes. It represents Israel, God's people, right? So he takes 12 stones. And he builds an altar. And he puts some wood on the altar. Does he not? He puts some wood on that altar. And what does he lay on the altar? 
the offering, the sacrifice. In Elijah, verse 30 of 1 Kings 18, And Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. So all the people came near to him. So where is he calling them near to? To the altar. He's calling them near to the altar. Where is Jesus calling us? To the cross. Jesus is calling us to come to the cross. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two seahs of seed. And he put the wood in order, cut the bullock in pieces, and laid it on the wood. Where was the sacrifice? On the altar, on the wood, where was Jesus, the sacrifice? Where did they lay him? On the wood cross. Did they not? Think about the parallels here. And he put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, and laid it on the wood, and said, fill four water pots with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice on the wood. What is he trying to show us here? There's a couple of things going on. How many times did he ask for the four water pots to be poured on the, on the altar? Four times. Three times. Three times. Four water pots three times is what? Twelve. Representing once again the people of Israel. God's people. What is God asking us to pour at the base of his altar of the cross? What is he asking us to bring? Thank you. Our sins. He's asking us to bring our sins and lay them at the altar. There was so much water that it covered the sacrifice, it covered the wood, it came down over the altar and filled the large trench that had been dug full of water. Counterintuitive to wanting to start a fire, would you not say, to pour all that water on an altar? What is he looking to do? He's looking to have a burnt offering. And what did he ask them to do? The pour the water on the altar. Now in those days, they might have had some hot coals or some fire sticks or whatever. Do you think he could have started a fire like that? So symbolically, he's showing that salvation is totally out of our hands. You and I can do nothing to earn salvation. This sacrifice was going to be burned up by God and God alone. Only God could cause fire to come down and consume this sacrifice. You know, in Proverbs 26.20, 20, it says, Without wood, a fire goes out. Without wood, a fire goes out. Where was Jesus hung? On a wooden cross. If you and I are not studying the cross and understanding what Jesus did, we will have no fire in us. Because without the cross, there is no fire. So the people are watching the altar with the wood and the sacrifice. And we saw that Elijah says what? He says, come near. Come near. Jesus is calling us to the cross to see the sacrifice that he made for you and I. Verse 36, And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah called them close, and he said, Let it be known this day, Lord, that there is a God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, and hear, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and you have turned their hearts back to you again. So who's turning their hearts back? God is. How is he doing it? He's drawing, he's asking them to come close to the altar to see something. What do they see? Verse 38, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, and licked up all the water. The sacrifice, 
the wood, the stones, the dust, and the water. When you think about it, when Jesus asks you to bring your sins to the cross and lay them at the foot of the cross, symbolic of what they did here, all the tribes brought what? One canister of water for each tribe. Jesus is asking you to bring your sins to the cross and lay them down. And God will take them away. Some of us are afraid that God can't take away our sin. We go, it's so bad, it's so evil, it's so whatever. Go to Genesis and read that the word of God is powerful. He spoke the worlds into existence. You have no fear. God can take away any sin that you give him. Lay it at the cross. Lay it at the cross. Meditate on Christ and his life. Take the time every day and meditate on Jesus. Read those passages over and over again. Look at him in the upper room, how he deals with Judas, trying to save Judas' life. Look at him in the Garden of Gethsemane as he struggles, struggles with that human nature that didn't want to go to the cross. And he says what? Father, thy will be done. Praise God, he said that. Look at him as when he goes to Pilate and the way they treat him and the way Jesus treated him. Look at him hanging on the cross. What did he say to those that nailed him to the cross? Father, forgive them. Look at him as he hangs on that cross at the Sadducees and the Pharisees that were yelling and screaming to crucify him. And he says, Father, forgive Forgive them. Look at the way he treated the thief on the cross who asked for forgiveness and to be saved. Study his life. Where there is no wood, the Bible says, fire goes out. If you and I are not studying the cross, we will have no fire in our bellies. If we're not meditating on Jesus and studying his life, the true fire from heaven cannot fall. Solomon 8, 7 says, Many waters cannot quench love, nor can floods drown it out. There is no sin that you and I have ever done that God can't take care of. His love is so overwhelming, so amazing, so broad, so high, and so deep that he can take away any sin that you and I have ever done. We have barrels full of sin. He's asking us to bring them and pour them at the foot of the cross and let go. You know, in a drought situation, I want you to think about this. In a drought situation, it hadn't rained for how many years? Three and a half years. The rivers had dried up, the streams had dried up, and, and the prophet is asking him to do what? Take precious, precious water and do what? Pour it on the altar. Are your sins so precious that you won't give them to Jesus? Are they that precious that you won't let go? Elijah asked for the water to be poured. Jesus is asking for us to pour everything on the cross, to pour out our hearts to God. You know, in Revelation 12, 15, it says, So the servant spewed out water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. Have we been carried away by a flood? Are we soggy Christians? Let us go to the cross and give it all to Jesus. Because the cross is greater than your sins. You know, Elijah just prayed and fire came down from heaven and consumed those, that offering. I want to tell you today that the cross 
is the answer to people caught in prostitution. The cross is the answer for those addicted to drugs. The cross is the answer for those addicted to alcohol. The cross is the answer for those addicted to pornography. The cross is the answer. Go to the cross. Bring your sin to the cross, and Jesus will take care of it. You know, in Numbers 21, there was a time when Israel sinned, and God sent serpents among them to awaken them to their need. The serpents had always been there. And they came in and they started to bite the people. And God told Moses to make a brazen serpent and lift it up and to tell the people to do what? To look. To look and live. Jesus is calling you and I today to look at the cross and live. Don't look at other people around you. Look at the cross. Look up. Look up at the cross. Don't look at others. Look up. Stop looking at the serpents. You can't do anything about the serpents. Only God can change the heart. Only God can protect us. Just like Israel, only God could protect them from the serpents and only God could heal them. Lift people up to the cross. John 12, 32 says, And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. When who is lifted up? When Jesus is lifted up. Jeremiah 31, 3 says, The Lord appeared to us in the past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. That's the cross. That's what he wants us to be like, to draw people in with that unfailing kindness, with that unfailing love. Ephesians 2.7 says, In order that in the coming ages he might be able to show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. That is what Jesus wants for you and I. To be so filled with his spirit that we express his character his love, and his patience that people would be drawn to him. Not scared in, as some of the old-time preachers in the 1700s preached, the hellfire of a mighty, angry God. God draws by his everlasting love, by his kindness. When the fire fell, it licked up the water, the stones, the sacrifice, and it was all gone. Jesus can take all your sins away if you put them at the foot of the cross. What came after the sacrifice in Elijah's day? What came after the sacrifice? Who can tell me? What happened after the sacrifice was done? God came, fire came down from heaven, it burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the dust, the water. And Elijah said, get rid of all these evil prophets. He had them killed. And then what did he do? He went up into the mountain and did what? He prayed. And what came? Rain. Rain came when he prayed. But there's an order. We need to give our sins to the cross, to Jesus first, and pray for rain. We need to have our hearts changed. The Holy Spirit comes to empower us to do the work, but unless we're willing to do the work by the early reign of the Holy Spirit, we'll miss it. He's asking each of us today to give our sins to him right now. Not tomorrow, not a week from now, right now. Because he wants to come back. I don't know about you, but I'm a little tired of the news lately. People are angry towards each other. They're unkind towards each other. There's all these shootings in the schools in the United States. There's shootings all across the globe. 
There's bombings. There's, you know, slavery. And slavery is still going on today. One of my former pastors, and I mentioned this a long time ago, his brother who lives over in the UK, his daughter's missing. She's been missing for over a year. Did you know that there's sex slaves today? They take young ladies and they pump them full of drugs and they turn them into sex slaves? It's still happening today. Are you tired of it? Because Jesus wants to come and put an end to it. Are we so tired of all that's going on that we're willing to give Jesus all of our sin and truly pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Because the rain comes after the sacrifice. The rain comes after we give Jesus our sin. You know, the disciples were critical of each other even after Jesus had passed. They had sin in their lives. They'd been with the master for three and a half years. And not until they came together and prayed and confessed their sins and repented of their attitudes and I'm greater than thee and I'm better and I'm smarter and all that nonsense until they came and confessed it all and repented, the latter rain didn't come. But God has promised it will come. And you and I can have it if we're willing to confess our sins and repent. I don't want anyone here to miss that opportunity. How sad it would be if the rain was falling all around us and we didn't even know it. Jesus is calling you today to bring your barrels full of sin and pour it out at the foot of the cross. Our closing hymn this morning is number 245, More About Jesus.
Father, you remind us in John 3 that you sent your Son who was in heaven with all the angels worshiping him in perfect harmony with you for all eternity who came here for us, each and every individual who's here in this room. He came not to condemn us, but to save us. Father, help us to understand. Please touch our hearts. Humble us before thee and change us, O oh Lord, that the distractions of the world would not hold us, that we would see Jesus in all his glory and be changed. As we behold him, Father, help us to behold him in all of his beauty and all of his holiness, that we would be changed by beholding, we pray. May you touch each and every one who is here. And Lord, I ask if there is anyone who has never given their life to Christ and they wish to do so, please talk to me on the way out and we will pray for them. May you bless each and every one, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching our channel. On behalf of Three Angels, we would like to offer you a free gift. Do you have questions about the Bible you would like answered? Well, Bible Readings is the book for you. Thousands of questions about Bible topics are answered with scripture texts in this book. If you would like a totally free of charge copy, please call the number on the screen or send us a message on our website. Thank you for tuning in and God bless you.